Good afternoon, everybody. No problem hearing me. Usually don't even need a mic. I don't want to get any feedback here. So today I'm excited to present to you Mahmoud, who has graciously agreed to talk to all of us today. And he's a Kenwood resident as well as Professor Emeritus at McAllister College. And so today we're going to talk about his book, Haiti, The Hidden Truth. And I'm going to let him go ahead and do that. So let's give him a round of applause. Thank you, my dear, for that. Um, I don't like long introductions. Thank you, Brandy. I'd rather, I'd rather surprise than disappoint our audience. Um, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to discuss uh, something that's been a part of my life since I was a 10th grader. Now, I'm not uh, that's when Haiti became my life. Never been to Haiti. Had more than enough chances to go there. You know, just a friend who had two or three churches there, and he would always invite me to come. He's such a nice man, I didn't want to disappoint him because I had conflicts with that, the role of the church and uh, NGOs and all of those people. We were supposed to be helping Haiti. Um, and I had some criticism of the way they the way they do that. So I've never been to Haiti, but it's been a part of my thinking for most of my life. One of my nephews is married to a Haitian. Um, I've met I don't know how many Haitian students. I've counted Haitians among my friends. And it leads to my biases. I think we all have one. It took me a long time to get to this point in talking to people. You to let them know who you are, who they are. And it took a while to do this, admitting your biases. I'm, I'm a biased person, and uh, I'm in favor of some people more than others. Mm -hmm. I, um, I'm in favor of the lowest, the least, and the lost, wherever they are. That's a position, that's a principal position. Um, for people who've been robbed, oppressed, and degraded, by whom am I? I don't care about systems. You know, what do you people say? Well, that's communist, and that's capitalist, and that's not the deal. <laughs> you know, it's whether a system mistreat, mistreats human beings deliberately. I'm opposed to that. And so that's a bias right there. It colors everything I say. You know that. Um, I also um, am a champion of youth. When I was young, I was serving youth. That's most of my conscious life has been about serving young people, even when I was 16. And I functioned primarily as, if you want to stretch the word, as some kind of educator. Uh, uh, some kind of activist, or even though I don't like that term, so much, but I know what people mean. I, 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 I spent most of my life on the side of people, and I'm from among those peoples who have been abused by power. It's simple and it's all about power. It's not Democrat, Republican. Not with me, 
this side of the aisle and the other side of the aisle. The question is, what is the deed? The deed is what matters. And so I condemn the deed, no matter who's doing the wrong. It could look like me. It could look like Idi Amin. I'm opposed to it. Very clear on that. This is a human question. I also have an odd sensibility that makes me bias. I think in the generality. Women and girls make better human beings than men and boys. And I'm not just saying that to you because you're mostly women. That's true. Anybody who knows me knows that. And it's not just because I, the major influence of my values, it was a grandmother who was the first generation out of slavery and who started me on this trip that I'm into now. She taught me how to read. I'm like many black children who are first generation free black people after the Civil War. It's one of the greatest stories never told. It was those people who were slaves who learned to read in spite of the world. It was an illegal right to learn to read and write. I always remind people Frederick Douglass never spent a day in school in his life except to go to Western Reserve University the first time he went out of school to address the graduating class. That's what and I think is Tom Brokaw. I think the people, the four million people who came out of slavery in 1865 are the greatest generation ever. That's what I think. Not what you think not what black people think. <laughs> I don't think for black people, and any of my students know that. You know, it's a position. I'm dare to say, I try to be a moral human being. I'm supposed to be that. I know that if you're American, <laughs> you're supposed to be a moral. There's some, some things to me are just defensively wrong. And I go against anybody of any color, so called race, which is utter nonsense to me. Not everybody else. I think it's the greatest hope ever perpetrated against humankind. It has a lot to do with this. I think the idea that we think we belong to distinct, discreet, never changing races is complicated nonsense. And people have made it so. Science should help us out now. That's who created race. <laughs> now, this is a kind of introduction to what I'm saying. And I won't spend a lot of time. But I want to be. I want you to know where I'm coming from. So we just say, guys, oh, he's a communist, he's a this and that and the other. And it's, it's, it's just terrible. I'm just me. It's the way I think. And I'm bound to any ideology, but I'm bound to certain ideas about freedom, justice, and respect for human beings. Because they're human beings. No, you don't need to qualify that. That's my stance. Okay, here we go. Uh, thank you for those of you come out to hear an office point of view on hate. I need not bore you with the statistics and what hate is. Haiti is the worst circumstances any human beings ever created for themselves, I guess. You know, we know it's a land of disaster, a land of disease, a land of death, a 
land of political corruption, Tom Tom, the crew, thugs running the streets, beating up people. And it was the land of voodoo. I don't know who made that up. Her name was Verdun. It's a god of certain African people. It's a religion. And I define religion as anything to which human beings owe their highest loyalty. That's what I think religion is. That's why I think white supremacy is a secular religion, like communism. It's a secular religion. So the, the thing to which you owe your highest loyalty above everything else. That's my assessment. The um, Haitian story, for this point, I don't want to take up all the time. That's another thing. Uh, right, I guess, oh, she's not here. But why not so many times? Right. Give me 20 minutes. You're fine. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know how time is. <laughs> time. Time is a neutral variable. You can make anything you want out of time. Why do the Greeks have eight days? And the Yoruba people in West Africa have 10 days in a week. Because you can do what you want with it. It's the human creation. Time. So Haiti is the breadbasket case of the world. All the senses of the flesh you can find there in abundance. I mean, it's just, and they were really bad people. And tied to this voodoo, which is a corruption, that's the colonial oppressor's definition. Verdun. Um, I can say this about these religions in out of Africa is that Latin America is above America, and this sense that religion, African religions, thrive in many parts of Latin America. Santiago thrives in communist Cuba, which is supposed to be based on atheism. Why did it look the other way? Castro. It thrives. The same thing in Brazil challenges Catholicism. And they recognize that you know, Africans have religion. And let me say this, and I'll get off the religious kick because I don't want to insult anybody. <laughs> you know, and I've already done that, I guess. Too late. But I was once talking to uh, an African. I went to school a little bit in Ghana, and I got to know the uh, curator of the museum. And uh, one thing that the God they call God, you owe y'all made these people. And I just wanted to know, because I am American, like though I am a lot like white Americans. I know that this is one of these things in my head. You know, well, well, who is it? You know, where, where did it come from? What, when, you know, was it? You didn't come. You got to come, you know. Religion, what's the dispensation? When did, who brought it? Nobody brought it. How, how can you have a religion, you know, without the prophet and the dispensation? You know, the Moses, the Jesus, Muhammad, right? Uh, Zoroaster, right? Uh, well, he said, uh, well, we don't have that kind of religion because religion is timeless. We have has always been here. And come. <laughs> He's always been here, where? Everywhere. Where is he? In the tree? Yeah, what? Water? In the earth? In the wind? In the rain? In the trees? That's who God is. Nobody brought us any dispensation. That's a tough one. That certainly was a tough one for me. Oh, uh, because. I was baptized, yes, as a Episcopalian. And it was a nominal Christian. 
I guess until the Vietnam War is when it really has begun to mission stuff like my faith. I carry a Muslim name, but I'm not a member of, of, of Islam. I have many Islamic friends. That's a name that belonged to a great historian of religion, Timbuktu. And I studied him a little bit. The family of scholars, Mahmoud al Khatis, the last string of great scholars who wrote the history of West Africa in her day. That's why we know where Timbuktu was. That's why we know, we know that's probably the most famous word in any language is Timbuktu. And it still stands at the bend of the Niger River, right? It's a ghost town. It once was a thriving city, trading with people above the Sahara, including some of the people who now call Spanish. And that's who put the word in our vocabulary, the, the, the Iberian people, who knew African before the slave trade, were trading with them. It was a little red gang. Um, why I talk this way is because this is a this did come from a man of who was a scholar at uh, in Eden. It is why I talk the way I talk. Said everything is related to everything. Everything has a place, and yet everything is related to everything. <laughs> And there are no free lunches on this earth. I think like that. Because one thing is related to another. You know, I'm related to you in some sense, in spite of the doctrine of white supremacy, which I've been arguing against most of my conscious life. Anybody who's been around me knows that. I think the race is a myth. Now, I don't mean this little play play thing, but the children, that's not the kind of myth I'm talking about. Human beings are myth making creatures. Black people make myths. Everybody makes myths, but there's never been a myth like this as destructive as this idea of race and the practice of racism, ISM, from a practice that was created within the last four or five hundred years. There were no people on this earth until Christopher Columbus got launched. Yeah, I said that it makes a lot of people mad. Don't care what he said he was lost by calling these people what? Indians. Yeah. Indians live in India. All human beings get their name from land and language and skin color. I think so. We know that. See, a lot of people know stuff and don't want to acknowledge that they know it because they mess up the script. You know, I know that many, many people who have called themselves white or whatever know exactly what I'm talking about. Some don't, I'm not kidding. Some people really believe in the myths. You know, like the people who went to the Capitol in January. Yeah, hey, actually, I don't think they're kidding them. That's real. They believe that. And that's what race does. It, 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 you see, not with your eyes, but with your beliefs. And you impose your beliefs over everything. Why it is it such a terrible place? Because people want that to be so. It is poverty there. There is good political corruption. You know, there are bad guys, Tom Tom Makula and so forth. Yeah. But there's something else. Life is too there's nothing that simple. Human beings are not that way. There's no such thing as a simple human being. You can be a simple-minded, I agree, in my name sometimes. But you're not simple. That's a contradiction in terms. And Haitians are not simple. So 
very bright people come from Haiti. And the trouble that Haiti's in, I mean, is it is something that people ought to be applauding all over the world for the achievement, the achievement of nations is the simple and overriding fact. And they're the first people in the history, in recorded history that we know of which a slave society overthrew their masters. Nothing to compare with that. It inspired people all over the world at one time. It inspired Simon Bolivar, who was often seen as a, as a liberator of Latin America. He met with Haitians. He talked to Haitians. The leaders of the Haitian Revolution, the great triumvirate of of Chusanti over Chu Jacques, Jessalines, and Honore, Christophe, leader of the greatest military leaders ever. He said, How can you say that? Well, they just helped to defeat the most powerful army of its time. I ran them out of Haiti twice with their tails between their legs. The most powerful white, I don't believe that nonsense, but I'm saying that. State, Napoleon fought Bonaparte. The brave economy of, 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 of the French, the most powerful state, had Europe on its knees from 18 up until um, the, the German coalition at, at, uh, in Belgium, where they were defeated. He was defeated that story in 1815. Haiti had done that 10, a decade earlier. That's what we can afford. It's not the Europeans, not the first people to defeat Napoleon. It was Africans. The band of little ragtag Ebos and Houses and Yorubas and Fry Fry. They organized something people are not supposed to do if you're black. They, they were unified. They were different peoples in Africa. That's what it, it didn't belong to any Negro race. That's nonsense. Chusan the Overtu was a, an Ashanti. People who I identify with in Ghana. Very bright people. He was uh, Jacques Desaline was a, was a, Yaruba, who lives in the northern part of Nigeria. It's another thing, what makes me say people know what I know and they won't say anything about it. I mean, I'm talking about intellectuals now. <laughs> right? People at the University of Minnesota, Wisconsin, Abad, they, they know this stuff <laughs> better than I do. And I spent most of my life as an adult in academia around these people. They know 10 times more than I do what I'm talking about. Why isn't that more generally known? Why isn't that true? I'm not making that stuff up. There was a Chusandi over you. There was a Jacques Dessalines. And they kicked Haiti, kicked France out of Haiti twice, and liberated the island from the French, from the uh, English, and the other party, the Spanish. When they gained their freedom, they gave Haiti its original name of the Tano, Tano people, not Indians, Tano people, not Indians. They didn't speak Indian, and they were eliminated shortly after. Um, the first one, Hispaniola, the, the Spanish started the genocide of the French got it for a while. And the same thing took place. And people, there may be a handful of descendants of Tian people in Haiti. It's, it's the blacks of the island. General uh, Bishop Bartholomew, a caring, sensitive Catholic. Uh, he, this is why you can't go for the race stuff. I can't make it. He's white. I'm supposed to say he's no good. No. This man 
he did a good and a bad thing at the same time. He felt for the Native American people. And because of the Spanish contact with Africa, when they were trading with one another on a minor scale and slave level on a very minor scale, it was he trying to help the Native Americans who influenced the leaders of France to import more Negroes. Some of you know more about this than other. Negro is not, what is that? That's a, that's a harmless adjective in the Spanish language. I can't speak Spanish that well. I don't know whether I took Spanish or Spanish took me, but, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, and I'm not a linguist and I don't know a lot of stuff. I'm, I'm good in two languages, though. Broken English and profanity. I'm really good at that. But, uh, Bishop Bartholomew pleaded to bring the, because he felt sorry for the Native American by disease and genocide and so forth. And they already had a relationship with Africa before the discovery of America. There's a Negro factory, a Negro house in Ghana called Elmina. That's Portuguese for something like mine, mine M I N E, uh, was built in 1482. Chris didn't show up until 1492. Christopher Columbus. A massive thing. You should see these slave factories. Like a small community almost built. Um, there are 26 of them in Ghana alone. They're all up and down the coast of Africa from Mauritania to Angola. These are slave factories for black people. Yeah, the Spanish people built most of them, but I'm sorry to say this, Christenborg, which is another castle in Ghana, was built by the Danes. And I hate to say that, but the Danes comes that you know, bias, but I like Danes. <laughs> they, they're different from other Europeans. You know, but they were in it. The Dane were there. They built this much, not the scale of, of El Nino, but it's not in the building that's very well structured and artistically impressive. And I just hated this find out that the Danes, oh, you were in it too. You know, what I mean to tell you that everybody was in it. There were leaders. The five leading nations, which is responsible for the Atlantic slave trade, begins with the Portuguese, so the oldest white, you know, I'm using white for convenience. I don't believe that. I don't believe there are any white people. I dare any human being, I'm telling you, to prove to me that you're white. Anybody. I'd like, to, I'd like for you to do that, you know. I don't think you can. You know, that's a question that's answerable. I, I'm just trying to answer answerable questions. It's not something that, that, that only I know, and I know very little, and I know that I know very little. Like Voltaire said, all that I know is that I know nothing, and I'm not sure of that. It's just a fact. Um, Haiti deserves admiration and respect from the human family. To liberate some people from oppression and inspired people throughout Latin America on the Simon Bolivar. That's why Latin America, the whole of the 19th century, it took the whole century. Uh, and Brazil was the last slave state in. 1888 to free its slaves. Same year that Russia freed its serf, which is interesting. So Haiti needs to be dealt with fairly by historians and all these other people because it is a magnificent story. I think it's the greatest story never told. It's an inspiration story. The great story of slaves overthrowing their masters. It never happened. Another tidbit, 
Demagnesia was inspired by the Haitian Revolution. Who was Demagnesia? You know, if we had a real history of America, we would know who Demagnesia was. He was the organizer of the largest slave conspiracy ever in 1822 in Charleston, South Carolina, at the then young and growing Mother Emanuel African American Episcopal Church where those nine people were murdered by this ancient tell yeah, this young man, 21 years old, sat down, prayed with him, and got up and murdered them. Nine people. That's greater than the Boston Massacre. Only five people were killed in the Boston Massacre. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> That's a massacre. And walked out of the building. He is a victim of the doctrine of white supremacy. Black people are victims, native people are victims, there's no question about it. The victimization of, of, of white people who are not allowed by that doctrine to be fully fleshed human beings any more than blacks. As long as that, that you can't blame him really. He did the act, the deed. How did you come by that? But Denmark Vesey was a name that you had to whisper on the slave plantation because of his, his conspiracy was greater than the one we may know, the Nat Turner Rebellion in Virginia in 1831. But he was suspected of being a Haitian, but still arguing over whether or not there were, a time he wouldn't let Haitians in New Orleans when uh, the revolution took place and the masses came to New Orleans and helped create the Creole Society. So I'm going to say over and over again that educated people, learned people, I have a, good, I have a different sense of what I call it. I think the Greeks were right in you say, leave me oneself out of ignorance continuously, never stop learning with a PhD. Yeah, that's what it's supposed to mean. Now the Greeks said it, so I know that's right. Right? <laughs> Greeks were right about everything. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's leading itself out of ignorance continuously. Not the other way around. It, it's, it, we are misleaders away from truth, away from knowledge, away from stuff right in front of you. And you can't accept it because the belief says you cannot accept African people, for instance, as a part of American history. We've been a part of American history long, longer than 80% of people who call themselves white. I don't believe it to I found him dating back as far as my family. I don't believe it. My family has been in every, the legitimate war, I'm telling you, that's once not. We don't count all the wars against the Native Americans. But I, we missed the Revolutionary War, but we've been in every one of them since the War of 1812. Longer than most people who all they have to say is white and claim the history and nonsense like that. I'll tell you a little story on this sideline about race. You're not talking about race, you talk about race. <laughs> Still, my favorite quarterback, uh, Drew Brees, if you're not a football fan, you might not know who he is, but he's, he is, he's the best, he's better than these tall guys. <laughs> but I don't know how he does that in a big man's game. He passes, he's a laser. And he was my favorite. And so, you know, the racial reckoning emerged, and the question about black people and the flag came up, and he pointed out that he had to differ with his teammates because uh, my uncle and my father went in World War II. I'm saying, wow. I like to sit down and talk to Breeze. And he's my favorite 
quarterback. I liked him when he said that. My stock, his stock, is him being went way, way down. Does he know he's around all these black guys playing in like that black people fighting wars? He didn't know that. So even though we know that, we don't know that. But you believe to allow you to say Christmas Adam. How many know that name? Thank you, ma'am. And I'm Sure, you're a well-educated lady. I know that, but uh, very few people, well-educated people. Now, now, John Adams said this. I didn't say this. On March fifth, seventeen seventy, the foundations of American freedom was laid by the death of that tall, woolly-haired Negro, knees unusually close together. The first to defy and the first to die for the cause of American freedom. I didn't say that. I didn't write that. They said that. The nation's first martyr is what they call the Negro. Who knows that? Well, they know at Harvard, they know at Princeton, they know at the University of Minnesota, but the guy who you meet on the bus or walking down the street may work with him, may even like him as a person. He doesn't know that. Who's responsible for that? I think the leadership of America generally, so which is they both have had their turn. You know, the black people are always, everything's related to everything. <laughs> black people are solidly Democrat. I heard a black man say I was born a Democrat and I'm gonna die a Democrat. That's kind of ignorant. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, in my grandfather's day. A black Democrat was as scarce as a buffalo. Oh, Democrat. The Democratic Party was founded by a slave owner. Jefferson and his buddy, Madison. They were founded. The Republican Party historically were the progressives. When they organized in 1854 and included people who were against slavery against the institution of slavery. And Abraham Lincoln was against the extension of slavery. He was not an abolitionist. But the myth is that he's, yeah, he's a father of black people's freedom. That's terrible. That simply is not true. The facts say that. I didn't make that up. Think about that. Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> nice guy, I think. <laughs> but at the root of this thing, he wasn't really for, for black people. He made some magnificent statements. I think he's, of all the presidents, he was probably the most tested and, and I think the brightest president. He was for to think on his feet. And he did that well. You know, but during one of the debates when Douglas accused him of social integration, I mean, everything what is related to everything. Douglas, Stephen Douglas, uh, the great debates, it's one of the seven debates, greatest debates in American history. Accuse him of being for social integration. And his response was, I have not known, nor have I ever been, of making voters or jurors of, excuse me, Negroes, not qualifying them to hold public office. And I will say, in addition to this, I believe that there's a physical distinction between the two races, which forbids the two from living together in terms of social and political equality. And in as much as I can, we cannot so live, I, as much as any other white man, am in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. That is in between. He says some marvelous things. There's no question about it. 
in the name of freedom. But at bottom, when Frederick Douglass was invited to the first statue by ex-slaves built for Lincoln, he let them know that Mary Allen, in the fullest sense of that, he's a great man who's gone to that silent continent of eternity. But I must tell you that in the fullest meaning, the fullest sense of the word, Abraham Lincoln was not our man nor our model. Not our man, nor our mom. In his habits, in his association, in his prejudices, he was American, as any other white man. You know, I mean, racism has to be confronted if this country is to grow up. Now, this has been said, what you heard that before. I think black people. You know, I'm one of these black people, and I thought we were on the way during the 1960s. I think we had raised white supremacy in the run. We had a few white people putting up signs in their way saying racism must go. No, they said white racism. You don't need to say white racism. They say anything but what Jimmy Baldwin just said. When I say racism, I mean white supremacy, which is a doctrine like communism. And this country was founded on that principle, along with all the other things. The country, if you, the nature of America is self-contradictory. It is for freedom. How can you prove that? Well, all the numbers of people who come here, and it's, it's like God, heaven. I agree with them. The immigration story is a great story. See, I don't have any problem with that, with the Statue of Liberty and Emma Lazarus coin. It was a Marxist. How can you do with that? People don't know thinking. People don't want to hear that. It was extracted from her coin and put on. Uh, the Statue of Liberty at the base of it actually has been set up. The original idea of a Statue of Liberty came from French abolitionists. Okay. It was saluting Lincoln and the freedom of slaves. That's why that chain is down there. They don't explain that on the feet of Lady Liberty. It was a gesture from France, America's first ally. The, we have want to salute Lincoln and the slaves and the freedom. And they twisted that was in 1865. By 1886, they had changed the whole, that's when they finished the Statue of Liberty, changed the whole meaning of it and made it a gesture of refuge for immigrants. That's not the original reason. But it's a great story. African Americans who live in what we call the United States are not immigrants <laughs> any more than Native Americans are immigrants. You know what an immigrant is. You leave citizenship for one country to for another, and, and, and that's it. There's no big thing. The black people were here before George Washington was born, before the Constitution was written, when most white people didn't know where America was in the world. We were building America's wealth. People don't like to hear that. What do you think slavery was about? What, what, do, you, what do you think that was? Uh, some kind of ingathering among white and black people at a picnic or something? No, that's, that's what I mean. So I'm way. I said enough already about Haiti. Why Haiti? And I want to, to refer you to people who've gone much farther than I in Haiti. A good friend of mine, Randall Robinson, wrote a book called Unbroken Agony, describing Haiti. He knows a lot, much more than I do about it. And written much, I mean, vast tracts. He was he worked for Haiti. He was uh, he went on a starvation situation. He thought he was going to die when, when, when 
there was no help. One of these disasters that often comes to Haiti is trying to get help. He was taken off of uh, people had to save him who loved him because he was trying to get the attention of the world for what's happening. The, the organizations that come over to help never seem to be able to help Haitians. Uh, a lot of this stuff with these uh, NGOs, you know, non government agencies, is nothing but a hustle. I've been around some of them. It's hustle. That's why, you know, lots of money. People make lots of money. That's just the fact. Haitian and Haiti is one of the great sources of inspiration for humankind. Not just black people. That's what you ought to know. You know, the Haitians, they're feeding the pony. And as you see, his resources was, he drained the resources of France. And he was forced to give Jefferson, Louisiana territory on the cheap for $15 million. That's right. They're right to send the arguing in, in, in the Congress, Chichen, of people saying, had it not been for these little ragtag Africans in Haiti, we would not have been able to purchase the Louisiana territory, which made America twice the size that it was. Actually, I think you told me it. it's this twist of fate that we're not speaking French. You know, because Napoleon was about it all, about capturing other white people. You know what I say when I mean when I say white. I mean that's white is a metaphor to me for power. That's all. That's what it really means. It kind of means kind of Machiavellian definition of stuff. That's what it means to me. Stokely, Stokely Carmichael had the perfect entity, though, when he said all that black more than white people have that black people need is power. That's all. It wouldn't be this way if power was shared. And the Americans went crazy, particularly the liberals of France. That's when they began to withdraw. Around that, the central question is that slaves had no power, mass and have no longer descendants had no, no power. All black people had was conscience. And we want to exchange some, some powerless conscience for some conscienceless power. <laughs> Let's have that deal. This is what, so Haiti to me is something that needs to be studied and understood and appreciation and it's for its own right. I mean, people who want to be fair and try to understand that America is a part of an international conspiracy against Haiti. All the Western world, do you know what that means? Dr. Du Bois called it unforgivable blackness. A handful of ragtag Africans beat the most powerful army in the world. That's what that's about. It is a, it's an embarrassment to the doctrine of white supremacy. When it was flexing its muscle all over the world, even parts of China, that's what happened. That's why he is isolated. That's why he, he, uh, all the Western world ganged up, he'd been blockaded for years, put in these puppets for the government of the corrupt people and made Papa Doc and his son, Baby Doc, and all that. It, it started in the 19, uh, in the 1850s when the Haiti became stagnated. And Haiti, uh, the last time they were occupied U.S. Marines was in 1934. That's recent. That's who ran Haiti. The United States military. And the great story, the tragedy of young uh, priest, uh, Dr. Um, you know, the story in the election of 1990, that the first time in the history of Haiti you had a democratic election. And this young voice who doesn't come to me now. Aristide. Uh, Aristide. Aristide, yeah. Aristide, thank you. Perfectly good. Man is African-American white. You might have held that against the two. But they, he and people, he got rid of these categories of caste. You know, these castes, these 
It's just not white and black. He you know? had a caste system under the whites on the top, and you have somebody called a Franchise, depending on your kind of blood, the so called white and black blood. Think about this. I know that everybody in this room knows that blood flows in human veins. I think he died. And all of it's red. There's no white blood or black blood. Dr. Charles Drew proved that during World War II. Blood comes in types. It doesn't belong to white people and so forth. Or to. None of my children, I have three children, have my blood type, and that's common. And uh, women, for some reason or other, can translate types. I'm, 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 I'm B positive. The sun is O and another one is something else. In, in a blood sense, I may be more akin to people who think they're white than I am to my own family, because there's a lot of, you know, I'm, I'm B positive. And you may be B positive. <laughs> I want to know who did the work? What, what context is wrong? Who did the work? Work on what? On what? Of, of building, of establishing. Of, of uh, making uh, churches, schools, educating the children. Uh, Who did that? Well, he should try to do some of it, but it was largely outsiders, which determined that. I know what you're saying, people outside, but Haiti had not sensed that the, the revolution was oppressed. It has never been a challenge of its own destiny. But it has. Yeah. Okay. I mean, Somebody it, has to do it. Well, I mean, what, what are you saying? I'm critiquing it in a, in a I'm very saying good. Get off that chair and get up and teach us. Get off <laughs> that chair and get up and teach us. And it. get up and teach us something about religion, about origin. Uh, is that a question directed to me personally that I should get up and go teach? Yeah. I've been doing that most of my life. That's what I've been doing. I didn't choose to be in the movement. It chose me and my grandmother. Yeah. And, and I'm people. listening. Yeah, well, I've been, what you're saying is I've been choosing, I've talked to everybody in the American community, not just black people. I've been all over the country. In different schools. I've been in white on white schools, white on, well, I was the only black person in town. There are black people like me all over America who've done that. That's funny. You were talking and I wasn't even 